Welcome to the 10th session of our Old Testament series. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful, and kindle in us the fire of your divine wisdom, knowledge, and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. During our past sessions, we've been talking about the Book of Pentateuch. The book of books of Pentateuch. They're the first five books of the Bible. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We now move away from those books and we go into what's called the books of the prophet. The prophets are the latter prophets and the former prophets. At the same time, it's continuation of what they call the Deuteronomic history. Deuteronomic history, we, we said that in the first five books of the Bible, there are actually several different traditions at work. We have what is called a Yahweh's tradition, the writers who use the name Yahweh, the Elohim tradition, those who use Elohim for God, and then there's also a priestly tradition. And the fourth is now Deuteronomy, Deuteronomic history. That really, that, that tradition keeps and car carries on through the history books of the Old Testament. And so we're going to see that familiar format used. Several things to keep in mind when we read the Bible now is that as it has before, there's going to be history but it's faith history. It's not history as we know it, not chronological history. So it's a history, but it's faith. And what that means is that they'll put into this book and books some ideas that didn't really happen the way we're told they happened. They took much a great part of history and kind of squeezed it together. And for instance, if there's a war, there might have been several wars, but they'll squeeze it into one war and make it sound like triumph, when actually it had triumph, defeat, triumph, defeat. They don't spend time on that. The idea behind this book now, Joshua, is that we're now moving into the history books, but the faith history, salvation history. What it wants to tell us is that God is working through the people of Israel. We saw in the first five books how Israel was able to set up the country, the land, the people, how to set everything up. They finally escaped from Egypt. They go out into the desert, they pass through the desert, and now at the beginning of the book of Joshua, we see where they are ready to cross the Jordan ready to go into the promised land. So the Bible continues. And as we have done in the past, we're going to pretty much stick to the history books. What I mean by saying pretty much or mostly, the idea behind that is that there's going to be some times we see how they set up the land, how they divide the land among the tribes, things that we might not be so interested in, but it's good history in a sense of saying, how, how did these tribes know where to settle, how to settle? And so that's what's being told here in part of the book of Joshua. We remember at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses dies. And so now we begin with the successor of Moses, Joshua, who's specially chosen to lead the people. He's a leader like Moses. And we'll also find that there are certain events in the book of Joshua that sound similar to parts of the book of Deuteronomy. The reason is it's kind of a parallel that's saying in the book of Don De De Deuteronomy, things are presented this way. But now we're going to see a slight difference in the way it's presented here in the book of Joshua. 
I'll explain that as I go along. So chapter one, after Moses, the servant of the Lord had died. The Lord said to Moses, a Joshua, son of Nun, Moses, my servant is dead. The book begins immediately, the book of Joshua begins immediately reminding us Moses has died. So now you and the whole people with you prepare to cross the Jordan to the land I will give you. They're preparing to go into the promised land. Every place where you set your foot, I have given to you as I promised to Moses. So they tell what this land is. As they go back in archaeology and start digging, finding out different ideas, they're saying much of the book of Joshua is giving conquest to the Israelites, a conquest that really took place before they even got into the promised land. But they're talking as though they came in and made this conquest. They're saying God was with them. God was guiding these people into this land. Up until this point, they were kind of nomads going through the desert. But now they're settling down in the book of Joshua. Once they conquer the land, they'll begin to settle in the land. So. He tells every place that I have given you, every place you put your foot is the land that I promised to you. No one can withstand you as long as you live. As I was with Moses, God says to Joshua, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So God is going to be with Joshua. Be strong and steadfast so that you may give this people possession of the land I have sworn to your ancestors. Be strong and steadfast. Be careful to observe the entire law with Moses, my servant, enjoined on you. Obeying the law, very important in salvation history. When they obey the law, the law God is with them. When they disobey the law, they run into different kinds of turmoil. God is saying, okay, I'll leave you on your own. See what happens to you. I have a lesson for us today. The idea if we remain faithful to God, God will be with us. Even if things go wrong, God will give us that strength that we need. And so that's what's happening here. So he gives them the book, the book of what happened. Actually, it was passed on by word of mouth. Joshua commanded the officers of the people, go through the camp and prepare the people, command them. Prepare your provisions. For three days from now, you shall cross the Jordan River here. So now they've come to the Jordan River. They're ready to cross it. They know there's going to be conflict. But he's saying, in three days, we're going to cross the Jordan. It's going to begin. Joshua addressed the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Again, recalling the book of Deuteronomy. When the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh, they were in Moab. Moab is on the eastern side of the Jordan. And they go to Moses, they say, we, we, we would like to camp here. At first, Moses objects. He said, we all promised that we would fight together. But then these tribes said, well, we'll go and we'll fight with you. But when we have conquered the land, we'll come back. We'll leave our women and children here. We'll join. Our warriors will be with you. So Moses agrees to that. So they go across with them. Your wives, your children, your livestock may remain in the land Moses gave you. It's beyond the Jordan, it's the way they look at it. So then the next thing they want to do is to reconnoiter the land, to see what they're getting into. And so Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent out two spies saying, go reconnoiter the land. 
When the two of them reached Jericho, they went to the house of a prostitute named Rahab. That's where they lodged. She could have been a temple prostitute in the sense that they had these false gods and they had these temple goddesses. But the report was brought to the king of Jericho. Some men came in last night, Israelites, Israelites to spy on the land. So now the leader of Jericho, the king, he's getting worried. So the king of Jericho sends Rahab this order. Bring out the men who have come to you and entered your house. So the king of Jericho knows what house these men went into. For they have come to spy on us. The woman had taken the two men and hidden them. So Rahab had hidden the men. True, she said, the men you speak of came to me. But I did not know where they came from. At dark, when it was time to close the gate, she tells them, they left. I do not know where they went. The implication is they ran out the gates just before they were closed, just as it was getting dark. You will have to pursue them quickly, she tells them, to overtake them. Now she had led them to the roof. So she takes the spies, brings them up to the roof of her house. In those days, a house was very often built against the wall. So they would build a house and use the wall that surrounded the towns as part of their house. In this case, possibly, it seems, uh, the house is a little taller than the wall because there's a window. There's no windows in the wall, so the upper floor probably was a little higher than the wall itself. She led them to the roof, and she hid them among her stalks. So they had these flax stalks. stalks. So she hid them up there. But the pursuers set out along the way to the fort of the Jordan, to the fort of the Jordan. They started on their way after them. They went out the gate and they were pursuing, they thought, the spies, but they never found them. So the gate was shut. So it happens then, before the spies laid down, she went up to the roof and said, I know the Lord has given you the land. Dread has come upon us, she said. We're really afraid. And that all the inhabitants of the land tremble with fear because of you. Everybody's worried. They've heard what happened. We've heard that the Lord, how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea. And that you, what you did in the battles you had. And how you defeated the great kings and great armies. We heard, and our hearts melted within us. Everyone is dispirited because of you. Now then, swear to me by the Lord that since I am showing kindness to you, you in turn will show kindness to me and my family. Give me a reliable sign. And you will allow my father, that you will allow my father and mother, brothers and sisters, and my whole family to live. So she knows they reconnoitered the land because they're going to invade. And she wants her family to survive. We pledge our lives for yours, they answered her. If you do not betray our mission, we will be faithful in showing kindness to you when the Lord gives us this land. So they're going to show kindness to Rahab. She let them down through the window with a rope, for she lived in a house built into the wall. So that was what the house was built into the wall. But as I said, the upper floor, the roof, probably uh, was a little higher than the wall. Go up into the hill country, she said that your pursuers may not come upon you. So she's telling them which way to go so that they don't get caught. Hide there for three days until they return. Then you may go on your way. 
And the men said to her, we are free of this oath that you made us take unless when we come into the land, you tie the scarlet cord in the window to which you are letting us down. So they give her a scarlet cord to tie on the window. That way, when they invade the land, they'll be able to see that scarlet cord and not destroy that house. It's a symbol, really, in many ways. In the book of Exodus, God tells them to slay a lamb and paint their doorposts with the blood of the lamb. It's a symbol, a sign. Same thing here, sign. Put this scarlet rope on your window. Gather your father and mother, your brothers, and all your family into your house. Again, sounds like the Exodus story. Should any of them pass outside the doors of your house, their blood will be on their own heads. So Moses tells the people not to go out. And if they go out, they're going to be destroyed, be killed. If anyone in your house is harmed, their blood will be on our heads. So they're making an oath. The oath is, we will not destroy you. So they went up to the hill country, stayed three days until the pursuers who had sought after them went home without them. So when they came back down from the hill, crossed the Jordan to Joshua and told him all that had happened, they assured Joshua, the Lord has given us all this land into your power. Indeed, all the inhabitants of the land tremble with fear because of us. So they're afraid. And so this is a different image. The first time when they Moses sends out a group, they come back and say, oh, the land is too strong. The people are too strong. We can't do this. Moses becomes upset. God becomes upset with that because the idea behind it, even if they look strong, God is with the Israelites. Nobody can defeat them. So they're all prepared now to go across the Jordan. The officers went through the camp and issued these commands to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God, which the Levitical priests will be carrying, you must break camp and follow it. But then he tells them, stay a distance behind it so that you may know the way to take. It's, it, you, you haven't gone over this road before, he says. So this will tell you how to get over this road. Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will perform wonders among you. So be ready. There's going to be some great wonder, miracle. Take up the Ark of the Covenant and cross ahead of the people, he tells the priests. And they took the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. So now they're ready to move. So the new day begins. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all the people, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I am with you. So right away he's saying, just as I took care of Moses, God is saying, I will take care of you. Command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant that when they come to the edge of the water, at the Jordan, they are to take their stand. So they're now at the edge of the water. They're meant to take their stand with the Ark of the Covenant. Joshua told this to the Israelites. But this you'll know that there is a living God in your midst. He will certainly dispossess before you the Canaanites. And they name all the people in the land. Again, actually, many of these people might have been destroyed for a week before the Israelites even came into the land. But what the author, the tradition tells, passing on by word of mouth, it sounds like the Israelites are the ones who conquer all these nations. So we have to say it's salvation history. The message here is God is with them. God is setting up the nation. It really is God setting up the nation. 
how they tell the story by our standards of chronicle history might not be perfect, but it's perfect in the sense of saying, God is with us. God is traveling with us. The soles of the feet of the priests carrying the ark of the Lord, the Lord of the whole earth, touch the waters of the Jordan. It will cease to flow. Similar to crossing the Red Sea. Now they're going to cross the Jordan. And the Jordan, like the Red Sea, is going to stop flowing. They're going to be able to walk on dry land across to the other side. The people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan. So the Ark of the Covenant goes before them. And once those carrying the Ark come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the ark was immersed in the waters of the Jordan. The path is open. The waters flowing from upstream halted. Standing in a single heap. For a great, great distance. So what happens now they can pass over. So they stay in the middle and the people go past. And they're able to get now to the other side. When all had dried, crossed on dry land, until the whole nation was completely crossed the Jordan, then the priest would come up and the water would flow back. Story found in Exodus. Again, comparison. Joshua is the new Moses leading the people. Just as Moses held out a staff, here now the Ark of the Covenant takes the place of the staff. But God is with them. The message for us, actually, as we read the Bible, we say, well, chronologically, it didn't happen that way. There was some conquest, many conquests, but not all the ones they give or attribute to the Israelites. That's not the important thing. The important thing for them and for us is that God is with us. Impossible things can happen. Not the idea of opening a path of water but things that we don't always see. So it's saying there's salvation history in the life of all of us. God is with us. We have to live by faith also, as well as by what we see. So now they set up memorial stones. So he tells them to take up 12 stones from the spot in the Jordan, in the riverbed, where the priests have been standing with the Ark of the Covenant. So as they're crossing, he chooses 12 men, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Carry them over and place them where they are to stay tonight. So that they carry these 12 stones. They're going to become symbolic. Selecting the 12 men he had selected from among the Israelites, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, go to the Jordan in front of the ark. Lift up on your shoulders one stone apiece. So they're meant to carry this stone. So now the those carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they come up. There's 12 stones coming with them. And the water flows back. That day, it says, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. So the Lord is now pointing symbolically and fully telling the people by this action, Joshua is the new Moses. He's the one you're meant to follow. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priest carrying the ark to come up from the Jordan. So now Joshua is in control. So he has the, he's the one who calls the people up from the Jordan. The people came up from the Jordan and on the 10th day of the first month, camped in Gilgal on the eastern limits of Jericho. So now they're into the promised land. They finally have entered the promised land. A place called Gilgal, near the Jordan River. Joshua took the 12 stones that had been taken from the Jordan. And he says to the Israelites, in the future, when your children ask their parents, what do these stones mean? You shall inform them. 
Israel crossed the Jordan here on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan in front of you until you crossed over, just as the Lord your God had done at the Red Sea. Symbolically saying, your children shall ask. In the Exodus, they have the children during the celebration of the Passover. The children shall ask why this night is so exceptional. And so the same thing happens now. The, the children ask, what are these stones? What do they symbolize? And that gives the adults a chance to tell them the story of the crossing of the Jordan. Now, the right at Gigal. So when all the kings had heard this and all the kings around, they were a little bit afraid. So now on this occasion, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives. Knives. They crossed the Jordan. They settled down. Word is getting around about this tremendous amount of people who have now come across the Jordan. And now they're ready for battle but before they go into battle we remember way back in the book of exodus again that god had told the people they weren't going to enter the promised land because they sinned they didn't trust god so what happens in not trusting god they simply lost the right to enter the promised land the warriors now, the ones who went to the promised land, are those who are born during the wild in the wilderness. So it's the next generation. And this generation now is allowed to enter the promised land. <clears throat> but the problem is they're not circumcised. And that's really important. The generation before them were circumcised in Egypt. But now these were not circumcised. And so what happens, they have to be circumcised. So they circumcise all the warriors. And now they are going through several days of healing. They could have been attacked at this time, could have been defeated at this time. But the book says nothing about that. Now Jericho was in a state of stage of siege because of the presence of the Israelites. No one left or entered into Jericho. And to Joshua, the Lord said, I have delivered Jericho, its king, and all its warriors in your power. Have all the soldiers circle the city, marching once around it. Do this for six days with seven priests carrying ram's horns ahead of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times and have the priests blow the horns. Down came the walls of Jericho, is a song. When they gave a long blast on the ram's horns and, and hear the sound of the horn, all the people aloud cried out. They shouted. The wall of the city will collapse, and the people shall attack straight ahead. This is what's going to happen. Have them march around for six days. On the seventh day, then blow the ram, the horns, and then all the people should shout, and the walls of Jericho will come tumbling down, and the people can attack the city straight ahead. So summoning the priests, Joshua, son of Nun, said to them, this is what we're going to do. Take up the Ark of the Covenant with seven of the priests carrying ram's horns in front of the Ark of the Lord. And he ordered the people, proceed and surround the city with the picked troops marching ahead of the ark of the Lord. So the troops are now in the, in the lead. They're ready for battle. Then comes the ark, then comes the people. When Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests who carried the ram horns before the Lord marched and blew their horns. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. In front of the priests with the horns marched the picked troops. The rear guard followed the ark. And the blowing of the horns was kept up continually 
as they marched. But Joshua had commanded the people, do not shout or make any noise until you hear the, the word shout. Then you must shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going once around it, after which they returned to camp for the night. The story of surrounding Jericho is confusing. The reason is there's actually two stories put together, at least two stories put together here. This was passed on by word of mouth, passed on in the northern kingdom, and actually carried to the southern kingdom of Israel many, many decades later. And so what happens is that the stories sound like there's two separate stories, and they are. So did they march around every day? Did they march once? Did, did, all of those questions. It's no concern of ours, no concern of the Israelites. The big thing is that the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. So they go around the city. On the seventh day, beginning at daybreak, they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only did they march around the city seven times. The seventh time around, the priests blew the horns, and Joshua said to the people, Now shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and everything in, in it is under the ban. Under the ban. That means everything in the city belongs to God. So the people aren't allowed to take any spoils for themselves. And actually, it also means they're meant to kill everybody, women and children. So they're supposed to get the women and children killed. And the reason they did this in battle in those days was because they didn't want to carry on worship of the false gods. And so they felt that if they just killed all the men, the women and children would still carry on the worship of the false gods and even contaminate the victors, intermarry, etc. Whether or not the Israelites actually carried out the ban is a question. In this book, the perfect book, the perfect story, they will, they do. We'll see battles happening where they're carrying out the ban. But right now, it doesn't mention that yet. So now what happens, the city and everything in it is under the ban. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are in her house with her to live, should be allowed to live because she hid those who reconnoitered the land. Everybody else is under the ban. All silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They belong to the Lord. They shall be put in the treasury of the Lord. So the conquerors, they're not allowed to take anything for themselves. As the horns blew, the people began to shout. When they heard the sound of the horn, they raised a tremendous shout. The wall collapsed, and all the people attacked the city straight ahead and took it. With the wall around, they don't have to go through any entrance. They just have to go straight ahead and take the city. They observed the ban by putting to the sword all living creatures in the city, men and women, young and old, as well as oxen, sheep, and donkeys. Again, whether or not this really happened, it's hard to say, but according to the author here, they, they carried out the ban. The two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said to them, you go into the prostitute's house and bring out the woman with her whole family as you swore you would do. Live up to your oath. So they took out Rahab and her father, mother, brothers, and all her family. And they led them forth to a place outside the camp of Israel. So they were saved. The city itself was burned and all that was in it. But the silver, gold, and articles of bronze and iron, they placed in the treasury of the house of the Lord. So Rahab is spared with her whole family. On that occasion, Joshua imposed the oath. Cursed be the Lord, cursed before the Lord, 
be the man who attempts to rebuild this city. Later on, one of the kings of Judah will want to have the city rebuilt and everything will go bad because they're under the curse of Joshua. So now they have a battle. So you have another battle. We have now Jericho has fallen. They've conquered Jericho. But now they act treacherously with regard to the band. What happened is there was one, Achan. He was one, took goods that were under the band. And the anger of the Lord flared up against the whole Israelite nation. So the Israelite nation was now under the anger of God. Joshua next sent men from Jericho to Ai, Ai, the name of the place. And he says to them, go up and reconnoiter the land. They come back and they say to Joshua, do not send all the people. If only about two or 3,000 go up, they can attack and overcome. So it's not that great of defense there. So just send up about two or 3,000 people, warriors, and they'll take the land. About 3,000 of the people made the attack, but they fled in front of the army of Ai that defeated them. They pursued them from the, so the city gate to Shechem. They defeated them on the descent so that the confidence of the people melted away like water. So they were defeated. And, they, and Joshua, he doesn't understand this. They tore their garments and fell face down before the ark of the Lord. And they threw dust on their heads. They were in re, remorse. They didn't know what happened. Alas, Lord God, Joshua prayed, why did you ever allow this people to cross over the Jordan? Again, Moses had to pray for the people. In the desert, and say, why did you let us leave e Egypt? So similar to the book of Exodus. Why did you deliver us into the power of the Amorites? That they might destroy us. What would... Would, would that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. So if only we stayed on the other side of the Jordan, the Israelites in the desert, if only we stayed in Egypt. So we see it repeated. When the Canaanites and other inhabitants of the land hear of it, they will close in around us and they'll wipe off nation from the face of the earth. What will you do for your great name? Not only will they be destroyed, but the name of their God of Israel is going to be destroyed. In other words, the people are going to say, look what the God of Israel did to the people. Let them come into this promised land and let them be defeated and wiped out. It would make God look bad. God says to Joshua, well, stand up. Why are you lying there? Israel has sinned. You have transgressed the covenant. And so now they find out that someone broke the ban. And so they have to find out who it was that broke the ban, who took, took uh, things spoiled from the conquered Jericho. Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes. The tribe of Judah was designated, so he has it one by one. He's saying, God, show us who. So the 12 tribes come, and now, after looking at everything, praying to the Lord, the tribe of Judah is now pointed out as the tribe that broke the ban. Then the clans of Judah came forth, and they took a clan, one clan in the land of Judah, the tribe of Judah, so they were able to bring it down to the smaller group. And then in that smaller group, they found someone else. And finally, one by one, the families came forward. They're down to a family. So they started with the whole tribe of Judah, reduced it to a segment of Judah, reduced it to a family, finally, of Achan. A-C-H-A-N, Achan, son of Carmen. So they, they do that 
because they want to say which Achan it is. In those days, there were people who had similar names. And so they'd always say it was the son of. That would help people identify him. So finally, Joshua says to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and praise him by telling me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan answered Joshua, I have indeed sinned before the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. So Achan is now confessing. Among the spoils, I saw a beautiful Babylonian mantle, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. I coveted them and took them. Actually, he's stealing from the Lord because the band says everything belongs to the Lord. They are now hidden in the ground inside my tent. Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent and there hidden in the tent was the silver and all the spoils. They took them from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and has put everything out before them and showed everybody that Achan had done this. Everybody has to know this. It's a community affair, a community event. The whole community was punished. Now the culprit has to be known to the whole community. Then Joshua and all Israel, they took Achan. And with the silver and gold and everything he has stolen, and they stoned him to death. And so he's caused all his misery. Now that they have stoned him to death, God is appeased. Again, Israelite history. How it really happened, we don't know. Back in those days, they say anybody who sinned against the Lord could be stoned to death. We find that in the book of Leviticus, the book of Deuteronomy. We'll find how they take care of people who have sinned gravely against the community. So now they're going to have to try to capture the city again, capture the people, the tribes of Ai. And so they're the ones that would destroy them be earlier. But now they're going to come in after them. And what they're going to do, they're going to surround them. But the way they're going to surround them, they break down into different sections. And they have some hiding, some of their own people hiding near the city. And then Joshua leads some troops as though he's coming to fight against the people, the warriors of Ai, the fighters. They come out to meet Joshua, but Joshua and the troops with him, he has them all turn around and appear to be running away. And so the soldiers of Ai, they think they, they think Israel has become cowardly, and they start to chase after them. Once they get away from their city, those who are hiding behind the lines, they came in and destroyed the city. And then the warriors turned around and looked and saw the flames coming up from the city. And at that time, Joshua and his army turned around and ran towards the warriors, who were now surrounded on both sides. And so they conquered them. And so simply, it's a description of a, a war, an interesting description. What's happened up to this point is we see how God is with the Israelites. God is working with them. And so God works here. And then we have a group of uh, conquests by the Israelites. So the book from chapter 9, it tells about the going ahead and, and conquering the people. And they conquer so many that there's a group in Gabal. And they're really afraid of that. So what happens, Gibeon, the inhabitants of Gibeon, they're saying, well, what can we do? <laughs> They'll come, they're going to slaughter us once they run into our army. And so they chose provisions for a journey. Uh, they took some old sacks from their donkeys, old wineskins, torn and mended. They wore old patched sandals and shabby garments. And all the bread they took was dry and crumbly. 
So they wanted to appear as really poor and people who had been totally worn out, almost uh, living with famine. Thus they journeyed to Joshua in the camp of Gilgal, where they said to him and to the Israelites, we have come from a far off land. Actually, the land was not that far off. We have come from a far off land. Now make a covenant with us. You may be living in land that is ours. How then can we make a covenant with you? But they answered Joshua, we are your servants. Who are you? Where do you come from? They answered him, your servants have come from a far off land because of the fame of the Lord your God. For we have heard reports of all that you did in Egypt. So it's the word of God that they're worried about. In those days, and I mentioned this before, it wasn't just a battle between one nation and another. They saw it as a battle between the gods. The nation that succeeded in conquering another nation, they would say the gods of that nation defeated us. And so that's what's happening here. God is always seen as the one who conquers the others. So God of Israel, that's what they're talking about, the God of Israel. So our elders and all the inhabitants of the land said to us, take along provisions for the journey, go to meet them. Say to them, we are your servants. Now make a covenant with us. This bread of ours was still warm when we brought it from home as provisions the day we left to come to you. But now it is dry and crumbly. So they're making it sound like they really came a great distance. Here are our wineskins, which were new when we filled them, but now they are torn. Then the Israelite leaders partook of their provisions without inquiring of the Lord. Joshua made peace with them and made a covenant to let them live with the leaders of the community sealed with an oath. So when Joshua saw this, he would allow them to live. They would not be destroyed. And they made an oath to allow them to live. <coughs> Excuse me. Three days after the covenant was made, the Israelites heard that these people were from nearby. So now they learn these people were from nearby. So they realized they were tricked. The third day on the road, the Israelites came to their cities, but they didn't attack them. That's because the leaders of the community swore to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. The entire community grumbled against the leaders. So all the Israelites say, oh, what are we doing? <clears throat> These all remonstrated with the community. We have sworn to them by the Lord, the God of Israel. And so we cannot harm them. So even though they were deceived, they did make an oath. They made a type of covenant with these people. And so they can't go against that. Let us therefore let them live. And so deal with them that no wrath fall upon us. Because of the oath we made with them. Don't, don't make us break our oath. The leader said to them, let them live and become hewers of wood and draw us of water. That's the work of a slave. Let them live and make them slaves. Let them live as slaves, as servants for the entire community. So the community did as the leaders told them. So they let these people, again, what's happening here as we read the story, they're showing the importance of a covenant, the importance of an oath. They've made the oath. They cannot break it. And so that's what's being shown here through the story. So Joshua calls him again and says, why did you deceive us and say, we, are, we live far from you? You live among us. You were right here. Now you are accursed. Every one of you shall always be a slave. So what's saying now, you're always going to be slaves to us. They told Joshua, your servants were fully informed 
uh, how the Lord your God commanded Moses, his servant, that you be given the entire land and all the inhabitants. So they heard that the Lord, the God of Israel, was going to give them, the Israelites, this land. And they realized they couldn't fight against the Lord. Since, therefore, at your advance, we were in great fear of our lives, we acted as we did. And they're saying, we deceived you because we were afraid. And now that we are in your power, do with us what is good and right. Joshua did what he had decided. So on that day, he made them as they still are, viewers of wood and drawers of water, meaning slaves, for the community and for the altar of the Lord in the place the Lord would choose. So now what happens? Um, <clears throat> they have sieges, seizes. They keep winning these battles. And so they battle as they keep winning them and winning them. They begin to become very much of a conquering community. So they get into battle with many people. And then they run into a group, a group of armies, five kings come together. They're going to destroy them. But the Israelites destroy the king's armies. And the five kings, they escape into a cave. And Joshua has them put a big stone in front of this cave. And then he continues the battle. When they conquer these nations, then they move the stone. They bring out the kings. And they'll eventually be put to death. So with the idea behind that again, the strong armies cannot even de destroy the Israelites. The God of Israel is too strong for the false gods of these other tribes. So it goes on to talk about the conquest of uh, the group, the community, the Israelite community. So then they give a list. And that doesn't mean much to us as we see today. Because today, when we're not as concerned about what kings were destroyed. So in reading the Bible, people could skip this section here because it's not going to be much help in knowing all the information. And again, it's salvation history. So it's elaborated. It's really exaggerated in many cases. So that's chapter 12. Then we come chapter beginning in chapter 13, the division of the land. Now that they have conquered the land, they have the 12 tribes. How, how are they going to divide up the land? So what happens now is that they begin to divide the land. And so again, we read how Joshua and the others, how they turn over sections of the land to each of the tribes. The uh, amount of how much land is given to each depends upon how many people there are in those tribes. And so those with many people will get a larger portion. So he tells us that Reuben gets a section, Gad gets a section, Manasseh gets a, gets a section. They're Transjordan, across the Jordan. They're the ones who aren't in, in the promised land itself, but who wanted to stay over the eastern section of the Jordan. So they found the land there, fine, that's what they wanted. So then the other tribes, the western tribes. So Caleb, he gets a section because he's been faithful all along. And Caleb and Joshua, they were the two who were faithful to God under Moses. They wanted to go and attack the land, but the others didn't want to do that. So the boundaries of Judah are set. And also, too, the cities of Judah are set. Then Joseph's tribe. If we think about the 12 tribes of Israel, there are 12 sons of Jacob. But then what happens is that the tribe of Levi is not given a portion of land. They're the priests. Their duty is to take care of worship, to take care of places of worship within the tribes themselves, the land of the tribes, or else even at the temple. They're given a section of land to help them, sustain them. And the rest of their income comes from their offerings. When people make a sacrifice, 
they'll get part of it will go to the priests, but they don't get a section of land. So there's 12 sons. If we take the Levites out, you have 11. So what happens now? So what happens now is that Joseph's sons get a section each, and that brings the number back up to 12. The Joseph himself would have gotten a piece of land, so that takes care of one of his sons. And the other son now, Manasseh, he gets a part of land also. So that's how they work it back to 12. Uh, Manasseh, he'll be uh, cu cut off in a sense. You have part of him in the Moab area, eastern part of the Jordan, and another section of land in the western part of the Jordan. But he's really just the one tribe with both parts of the Jordan. So as time goes on, they divide up the land and everybody is accepting the land and this is what's given to them. They also have to set up cities of refuge, places where someone who accidentally kills someone else can run to and not be killed by somebody avenging the person who was killed. And no one's allowed to kill anybody in the city of refuge. And then what happens now, they continue, they, they set up how the land should work. Again, something they'd be interested in, but perhaps we today would not be so interested in that. And then the Eastern tribes, they set up their section of land and they set up some stones like an altar. And those in the Western section of Israel, the promised land, they think that Reuben and Gad and part of Manasseh they think they're worshiping another God and they send out Phineas. He's the grandson of Aaron. And they meet with them and they have to convince Phineas that no, 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 we're not, we're not worshiping another God. We're worshiping the true God. But we know that it'd be difficult for us to have to cross the Jordan each time. So we set this up offering sacrifices to the Lord God. This appeases those living in the promised land. Then finally, we come to Joshua's final plea. So now Joshua is dying. He says, I'm old and advanced in years. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done for you against all these nations. Today, he says, as you see, I'm going the way of all earth. So now acknowledge with your whole heart and soul that not one of all the promises of the Lord your God concerning you has failed. So he has them, and then he asks them, he said, he makes, he's making a covenant. Joshua says, I'm making a covenant with the Lord, and I'm going to follow the Lord God, God of Israel. You can choose whichever way you want to go. And they all shout out, no, no, we're, we're going with the Lord. We're staying with the Lord God of Israel. They make a covenant. Now, throughout the other books, the worst thing anybody can do is to break that covenant. Finally, Joshua dies. So we have now, they're now died. They also bury the bones of Joseph in the promised land. When Joseph died, remember when he was dying, he told them to take his bones with them. They did it, and here they tell us they buried the bones of Joseph as they promised. Joseph, who brought them into Egypt, gave them refuge in Egypt. So now that's the book of Joshua. So the book of Joshua, the conquest of the Holy Land. So now we see with Joshua, it's really salvation history, good history, some of it, but also exaggerated history in many cases. And so as we continue on now, we'll be moving on into the book of Judges how these people were acting as they now have settled in the promised land. May the light of Christ lead me, the power of Christ be with me, the wisdom of Christ inspire me, the word of Christ instruct me, the shelter of Christ protect me, the hand of Christ hold me, and the love of Christ be in me. May the grieving find support in me, the sad find joy in me, 
the depressed find hope in me. The weak find strength in me. The doubters find faith in me. The rejected find love in me. And the world find Christ in me. And may Almighty God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.